Denny McLean went from baseball superstar to serving 23 years in federal prison. I went from a 31 game winner to public enemy number one. Beyond the Glory, next on Fox Sports Net. Whatever happened to Denny McLean, the kid that won all those ball games? Everybody really thinks they know. Nobody does. Mr. McLean's involvement in bookmaking activity. Well, here was suspended. The jury left for two and a half hours to convict. Conspiracy extortion and attempted cocaine smuggling. 23 years in a federal penitentiary. The trial was the easy part. The rest of it was uh, was just a, a living hell. If anybody knows what lies beyond the glory, it's me. This is Denny McLean, Beyond the Glory. October 1955. It was the end of innocence in the city of Chicago. These two brothers in the suburb board, when they were found, they had no clothes on them. They had been mutilated. This is the work of a mad dog. I was only 11 years old, but I decided to run away from home this day, the day that the bodies were discovered. It wasn't anything serious. I'd been playing ball in my neighborhood south of the city in a town called Markham. I let the sun go down without coming home. I was scared to death of my father's belt. And I've got to tell you something. When I finally came through that door that night, I got the ass whipping of all time. The police never found who killed those kids. And by the time the murderer confessed, I was on my way back to the slammer for the second time. in our living room. I can still hear my father playing. Tom McLean did a lot of things. Truck driver, insurance adjuster, factory worker. He was a great shortstop, too. But what I remember most is him playing that organ, smoking a cigarette. He was a tough guy. He was tough on me. He was tough on my little brother, Tim. But he loved us, and he let us know that. He taught us all of the important stuff in life, how to read, how to read music, and how to play baseball. My dad taught me the two guiding principles in my major league career. Number one, 
throw strikes. Secondly, no curveballs, no slider, and just throw hard, harder, and even harder if it was possible. And you know what? It worked pretty well for me. In the spring of 1959, Ernie Banks was king in the city of Chicago. The reigning National League MVP from the Cubs. That year, the White Sox made the series for the first time since the Black Sox scandal of 1919. I hated them sons of bitches. But that's not what I remember about 1959. I was a freshman at Mount Carmel High School. It was a Monday, May the 5th. We had a game that afternoon, and for the first time in my life, my father was not at the ballpark. And I was walking up the road uh, on Sunset Boulevard where we lived, and all of a sudden, as I started getting closer to the house, I saw all kinds of cars out in front of my house. And I remember saying something like, what the hell's going on here? So I walked in the house, and my mother grabbed me by both arms, and she says, your father's dead. And that's the way it was said to me. He was on the way to my baseball game, and he had a heart attack. Tom McLean was a tough man, but my mother was a hell of a lot tougher. Betty McLean was a cashier at a local grocery chain. She was really a hard-working, good-looking woman. Within a year of my dad's death, my mother remarried a guy by the name of Tom. Could you believe it? I'm 15 years old, and all of a sudden, there's another man in my father's bed. The guy wound up being a terrific guy. A lot of money, brand new car. He was a chef. I mean, he could even cook. But he couldn't play the organ worth a damn. Beyond the Glory on Fox Sports Net is brought to you by Wendy's. If you want to eat great, even late, remember, Wendy's rules the night. Let me tell you a little secret. There isn't a job in the world better than a major league pitcher. You only work every four or five days. They carry your bags, they charter your planes, they rent your cars. You get the best and biggest rooms in the best hotels. Choice tables at the finest, greatest restaurants. Sports writers chase you around for just one line a day. And the fans are beyond belief, they're incredible. But the best part by far, you're in charge. Nothing happens unless you allow it to happen. Even the greatest hitters can't do one damn thing about a dominant pitcher. Except wait for a mistake. I did not know who he was. And I found out as I was you know, sitting in the stands watching, but I thought he was very cocky, um, very sure of himself, and I really didn't like him. I was on the mound when I first laid eyes on the woman of my dreams in 1957. The Illinois State Championships, we won, and I was the star. 
you wouldn't give me the time of day. Certainly, there was a, a deep attraction for me, for me to her at least. And she only really said, hi, how are you? And that was it, turned her back and walked away at the event. She fell in love with a guy by the name of Kenny Hubbs. He was a great ball player in his first year with the Chicago Cubs. So I waited for my chance. Nineteen sixty-two. Kennedy and Khrushchev. Glenn and Shepard. Oh, that view is tremendous. Me and Hubs of the Cubs. I started the year in the middle of nowhere, and folks, I mean nowhere. Harlan, Kentucky. The White Sox signed me for seventeen thousand five hundred dollars the day I graduated from high school. First ball game I pitched in Harlan, Kentucky, I throw a no-hitter. Why? Because I had to get the hell out of Harlan. Kenny Hubbs, this good-looking 20-year-old rookie, wrote two new Major League feeling records into the book. Hubbs was the rookie of the year in the National League that year. How do you compete with that? He gave Sharon a ring right at the end of the season, and then he made a horrible, terrible mistake. He died in the winter of 1964, piloting his own airplane. It was a horrible loss. By then, I was a tiger. My dad said to me, look in the paper. He's the hometown boy. And he said, why don't you write him and congratulate him? So I did. <laughs> so I, uh, I started to call her and write her. By the time I came home from winter ball that year, I was broke from long distance telephone calls. By the end of 1964, I had worked myself into the rotation and had a partner for life. By 1967, we had everything. We had the arms, we had the bats, we did all of the little things. Bunt, hit the cutoff man, hit behind the runner, paint the outside corner. We did everything. We had some drinkers on that team too, and some gamblers. Some of us did a little bit of both. They'd get him in these card games, and he would uh, usually be what they called a fish, a dolphin, <laughs> and they uh, they took his money pretty good. My one addiction was Pepsi Cola. <laughs> I drank that stuff by the case. I even met a guy who worked for the company. Next thing you know, Pepsi's paying me 20 grand a year and stocking my refrigerator just for a few personal appearances. Anyway, me and Mr. Cola got to be gambling buddies. Boy, did we ever. We lost money at everything we tried. One day, Mr. Cola gets his bright idea that we're on the wrong end of this gambling stuff. He says, we keep paying out. He says, why not take the action? Mr. Barnum was right, folks. We were a couple of suckers, and we were born that day. There was a steakhouse in Flint, about 50 miles north of the city of Detroit, where I sometimes played the organ. We ran our bookmaking operation right out of there. Two guys, Clyde and Jiggs, would take the bets. Those were our front guys. Cole and I would cover the occasional loss. We started taking action on the races. Two weeks.
weeks in, I'm down $4,500. The next week, another three grand. Six weeks go by, and we haven't had a winning week. Nobody in the world beats the horses like that. We were getting hustled. So I got out. Then I got a call from Mr. Cola. Denny, you're not going to believe this. This guy put down serious cash on a long shot named Williamson Kidd. He says, he won. I said, what the hell do you mean he won? He says, he won 40 grand. <laughs> My first reaction was, so what? I'm out. I told you I'm out. But Cola was scared. He said the guy was connected. He said, Clyde and Jiggs have been tossing my name all over town. And he says the guy is going to kill me if I don't come up with the money. Now, I was totally convinced that this whole thing was a scam. Who is this guy, I asked Cola. I want to meet him, and I want to meet him now. There's a restaurant called Topinka's at Seven Mile and Telegraph Road. I show up and I wait for this guy. And wait. And wait. And wait. Mr. Mob never showed up. As bad a bookmaker as I was, and I was pitiful, I was almost a lead pipe cinch on the mound. The gambling was never about the money with me. It was about the score, about having success, about being in control of the element. Like what I had in baseball. Control. You're 24, 25 years old, you're invincible. So you take it one step further and you wind up doing some crazy things. I just want to do God's will, and he has allowed me to go up to the mountain. An assassin's bullet failed King as he stood on the balcony of this motel. And all over America, black ghettos exploded in rage and grief. 1968, what a year, folks. Seemed like the entire world was on fire. So help me God. It was a, really a mess and a scary time. But I think the team kind of brought the town together and uh, everybody talked about the 68 Tigers. They were a fun group of guys. probably the guy everybody remembers from the 68 team, but I want to tell you something. It's the best team I've ever seen execute the game of baseball. Seemed like every time I went out there, they got me two or three runs in the first inning, and the rest was easy. I had 16 wins at the break, and that's when I knew I was going to win 30. No doubt about it. You may recall what the great Dizzy Dean used to say. It ain't bragging if you can back it up. It's kind of fitting that I'd be the next guy to do it. I got number 20 by the end of July with the shutout of the Orioles. I got him again for number 27 the 1st of September. Boog Powell almost knocked me out of the game, hit a line drive at my groin. That's just how it went in 1968. September 14th, a bright, sunny Saturday afternoon. Denny McLean attempting to become the first 30-game winner in more than 30 years. The nation forgot its worries long enough to watch Denny challenge the record of the great Dizzy Dean. The Diz was on hand for number 30. I won that one from the dugout. Oh, 
Reggie hit a couple of my mistakes for long home runs, and the A's had a 4-3 lead going into the bottom of the ninth. But these guys picked me up again. Outfield is shallow. The pitch. Fastball. As soon as Horton hit that ball, I smashed my head in the dugout ceiling, which was about eight inches thick of cement. Kaline had to hold me up just to keep me steady. as happy as he was and the guys all grabbing him and it was just great. It really was. Number 31 came against the Yankees and Mickey Mantle. Mantle was my idol growing up. By 1968, he was pretty much done. Mantle came to the plate late in the game and uh, Jim Price, the uh, substitute catcher for Bill Freehand, was working back of the plate. Then he called uh, Jim out and said, we're going to let him hit one. I knew he was tied with Jimmy Fox for career home runs. Jim Price came back and told Mantle, he said, he wants you to tell him where you want it. He's going to groove it, and you can hit a home run. Mantle didn't believe it, and he fouled off a couple of pitches. And then I said, where the hell do you want it? <laughs> and he puts his arm out over home plate middle inside part of the plate belt high. Maybe it is out of here. Oh, no. You laid it in for him and everything. Uh, he didn't lay anything in. Yeah. He hit a good pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. But then he says it was one of his best. <laughs> well, whatever he says goes, but uh, I kind of had a feeling he kind of wanted me to hit it. Mickey got his home run. The wind up and the pitch. The line shot makes it. That is home. We got the pen. We're all behind our baseball team. Go get them. Detroit Tigers. Go get them, Tigers. I knew this was going to happen. Next stop, St. Louis and the World Series. Hey, Now, Gibson beat me twice in the World Series, but even Gibson wasn't going to deny us. St. Louis had a 3-1 to one lead in the series. Looked like the Tigers were all through. They played very badly, but the Tigers rallied, beat the Cardinals, and took the series back to St. Louis. I won game six on two days rest, and Mickey Lowlich, our star left-hander, did the rest. A foul to pass up. Here's Freeman. The strike, the new world champion. The city was alive. Everyone knew who we were, you know, and it was just, it was neat. It was really a neat experience. Danny McLean, and the beat goes on. He was surrounded by media. He was on the Ed Sullivan show. He was on all the national shows. And he was constantly hounded by everybody. Danny kind of ate that up, I think. And egged him on a, a lot of times when he shouldn't have, but he did. So I think he enjoyed every minute of it. Sure, I think I'm the best pitcher in baseball. If I didn't think so, I wouldn't be winning. The next year, I win 24 ball games. But there's only one way to go when you reach the top. What am I going to say? <laughs> I was 25, making terrific money. Boy, we really thought we had it made. But I put my faith in a wrong guy, a lawyer who said he was going to look after my money. You know, we were two kids trusting in someone else, and, you know, we got hurt. 
sure enough, we lost the house, lost the cars, lost everything. In total, he ripped me off for about $446,000. Sports Illustrated broke a story about my bookmaker. The article had Mr. Cola, Williamston Kid, and the 40 grand in it. It also had a mob guy by the name of Tony Giacalone, the guy that Jimmy Hoffa was supposed to be meeting the day he disappeared. In the Sports Illustrated version, Jack Aloni took me to his boat well to shake me down. That's where he allegedly smashed my toes. If you look back in 1967, I took a lot of heat during the winter of 67 because of my foot injury. That's the reason we lost the pennant. I didn't get to pitch in September. Sports Illustrated claimed that Jack Aloni smashed my foot because I didn't pay off a bet. What hogwash that was. I screwed up my foot all by myself. I dozed off one night watching The Untouchables. When I got up, my foot was still asleep and I wrenched it, getting off the couch. Honest to God, that is the truth. Thanks to Sports Illustrated, my phone started ringing off the hook. J. Edgar Hoover's boys got to me first. The feds confirmed exactly what we suspected. Mr. Cole and I got scammed. Technically, I was not a bookmaker. I was only guilty of trying to be a bookmaker. Mr. McLean's involvement in 1967 bookmaking activities leave me no alternative but to suspend him from all organized baseball activities. The commissioner of baseball, in his divine wisdom, suspended me for three months. He said the difference between me and a real bookie was the same as a difference between murder and attempted murder. What the hell does that mean? By that point, my career was going downhill fast. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Me and Tricky Dick. In 1968, he and I had the world at our fingertips. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. And six years later, they ran us both out of town. Nothing was ever going to top 1968. I knew that, and so did everybody else. But I sure thought I'd last longer. I was only 29 when I retired from the game. We had four beautiful children. and I've been trying to provide the best I can ever since. I made a little money playing nightclubs, the organ, piano. But when I hung up the spikes, the club stopped calling.
The only sure thing I had in the 1970s was on the golf course. Man, I could play. I played a money game every day. Worst case scenario, I'd lose maybe a hundred bucks, but most of the time I wanted to lose a hundred bucks to get the guy back. On a good day, I'd bag a few thousand, maybe even more. I put the winnings underneath our mattress in the bedroom. Sharon never knew how much was there until it was almost too late. All of a sudden, I smelled something, and I got up and I went to the back bedroom, and there was smoke coming underneath the door. We called Denny, and he raced back. And I says, is everybody okay? She says, oh my God, we lost the parakeet. I says, lost the parakeet? I said, don't you know what's in that bed? I grabbed the helmet and an ax from a fireman and got my $45,000. My Cy Young Awards, my MVP plaque turned to ashes. We did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. If the 70s were difficult, at least they were somewhat of a good time. The 80s wound up putting me in purgatory. I became a mortgage broker down in Florida. The people who came to me could not get a loan from a bank. I started doing business with some questionable characters. I knew some gamblers and I knew some drug users, all desperate people. One of the guys I loaned money to was a golfing buddy, a guy by the name of Bob Merkel. He just got behind, he had a disaster on his hands, but he came to me for the money. By 1985, Mr. Merkel was the U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Tampa, Florida. He indicted me on charges of racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, possession of cocaine with intent to distribute, and conspiracy to import more cocaine. I think eventually, I know eventually, that we will prove that, uh, and we will be vindicated out, out of all of this stuff. This is unbelievable. Jeez, to hear all of the things that allegedly I did, I mean, there was one allegation I was going to push a guy out of an airplane. I mean, come on. First of all, you can't open the door of an airplane at, at uh, 25,000 feet. Door's not going to open. It was pretty persuasive, uh, compelling stuff. I mean, there were documents that supported witnesses corroborating each other, some physical evidence, um, a very compelling case. You're going to believe what you want to believe. But I did not do any of those things in that indictment. I'm not an altar boy, and I'm associated with some goofy, crazy people. But I'm certainly not Al Capone. The judge sentenced him to 23 years in a federal penitentiary. Guys, there we get enough, huh? Guys, what do you think of the sentence? I've got children who want to be with their dad. You know, it's a very, uh, it's going to be a very difficult time for us. put me in a federal penitentiary, the Big House, Atlanta, Georgia. He would call every night. I think um, it was about 15 minutes, I think he could talk. Without it, I probably would have gone crazy. Those 15 minutes were the most precious of every day. I almost got killed one night because the guy thought I was using his time. He walked up behind me and bashed me in the head with a fire extinguisher. I wanted to kill the son of a bitch over a lousy phone. But that's what prison will do to you. I spent 28 months behind bars. 
Then a federal court of appeals made my day and reversed the conviction. The judges said I didn't get a fair trial. But my old buddy Merkel was hell-bent on retrying me. I agreed to plead guilty in exchange for probation and time served. Well, I didn't impose the sentence. Uh, and, and no, I would not have given him probation. Hell, at that point in time, after what I'd seen my family go through, I'd have pled guilty to Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, I'd have told him where Hoffa was. Beyond the Glory on Fox Sports Net is brought to you by SBC National Data Integration, going beyond the call. When I got out of prison in 1987, I swore that I would never screw it up again. He said, um, you know, how much he loved me and the kids. How we would never, ever have to go through anything like this again. How sorry he was. And he would prove that. I'm Danny McClain. I want to say good evening to you. Let me tell you something. Don't take it away from the fans. Great, thank you. Bottom line was it was time to get on with life, and we did. You have to play both sides of the ball if you're not going to be the DH. I had a TV show, a radio show, and I was making terrific money. It sure seemed that everything had fallen back into place. Sharon starts hitting me in the shoulder, and she says, the doorbell's ringing, the doorbell's ringing. The first thing he said was, do you have a daughter named Kristen? And I said, yes, we do. He says, well, she's had a car accident. And I said, is she alive? Is she OK? Is she fine? 2 o'clock in the morning, she come over the slight rise Never saw the truck because it was sitting there in the pitch dark. She hit the back wheel. Her car got jammed under there. Then this jerk off, uh, rather than stop, he pulls around into the center lane. Now she's facing the other way. 50 seconds later, here comes a drunk over the hill, hits her head on. I uh, began to drink a little bit, a lot, a lot of bit, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, I just lost a will to move forward. That destroyed him, destroyed the family. That, that was the beginning of the end. that he was going to buy this meat company with two other fellas. I thought he was crazy. I, re I mean, I just thought he'd lost his mind. It had been a fixture in Chesaning, which is a very small community, wonderful place. The core charge was that he stole $3.06 million from the Peatpacking Pension Fund. It's awful to buy a company you know that's dying and for it to eventually go out of business. That's what I was upset with, that we couldn't save the thing. But the benefit plan, no one ever lost a nickel. Betty McLean and Roger Schmeagel are both accused of conspiracy, mail fraud, theft, and money laundering. He disrupted so many people's lives. He's really robbed these people in this town. Sorry, what do you think about going back to school? Everything you work for, it's all gone. They got back not only all of their money, but they got back every piece of interest, every piece of penalty. They got back every nickel. Jury of 12 it took less than three hours to conclude that we had proved beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that they were guilty as charged. And, you know, that's not that easy to do. I didn't approve what they did. I didn't draw up a document. I didn't have anything to do with any of the maneuvering 
and the manipulation that Mr. Schmeagel finally wound up doing. He was the guy. I mean, naturally, he would dominate. And uh, no, there's no way it could have occurred without him. And I remembered what my husband had told me years ago. This would never happen again. I was not going to do it again. And I went and saw an attorney and filed for divorce. I got six years this time. Six years knowing that no one was waiting for me when I got out. I called Sharon from prison. I called her a lot. And I would just let it ring. Things were very strained. And uh, we didn't talk for a while then. And then he was coming home. down on his knee and asked me if I would please try one more time. It was a, an incredible weak moment she had because she said yes. Winning 31 games was terrific, but it was also very bad to have to live with that. I think it was kind of a jinx on him. I've certainly proven that you can be stupid more than once in your life. But uh, life is good. Life is grand. And, and it's only good and grand because of her. Basically, he's a good, good man. That's what I'd like people to be open to. Let him prove himself again. And I think they'll be surprised. Yeah.